Good afternoon and welcome back to the A4S Summit. I am Martina Tessari, Head of Europe at A4S, and I also lead our global work on sustainability reporting. In the last session, we heard some great insight on how the ISSB can be used as a global baseline, whilst ensuring comparability and compatibility with region, regional requirements. Now, for the final session, we will be exploring challenges and solutions with regards to the implementation of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, or ESRS. Now, the first set of ESRS was adopted by the EU Commission in the summer via Delegated Act, Act, and many organizations in Europe currently in scope of, of NFRD will have to start reporting from fiscal year 2024, meaning that those entities will have to start collecting the data from January. As the CSRD brings in scope of many entities at different stages of implementation, today we have the opportunity to hear the voice of investors reflecting on the direction of travel, as well as challenges and lessons learned by preparers in the first stages of the implementation journey. I'm very pleased to be joined by Will Olton, Board Chair of Eurosif, to discuss the investor's perspective with regards to CSRD and the ESRS and how he sees the topic of interoperability between different topics unfold. Will was appointed Chair of Eurosif in December 2015 with a career spanning over 20 years in sustainable finance. He is an honor honorary professor at Nottingham Univers University Business School's International Center for Corporate Social Responsibility co-chair of King Charles III Accounting for Sustainability Expert Panel, and sits on a number of investment industry advisory boards and committees. Hi, welcome, Will. Thanks, thanks so much for joining uh, our A4S Summit today and to provide uh, your perspectives. Um, I guess I'd like to start um, by asking you to introduce Eurosif and the role that the organization um, plays with respect to the EU and the wider sustainability regulated regulations and standards. Um, what are your policy priorities um, over the coming year and what role have you played with regards to the ESRS? Sure, I'll be delighted to, Martina, thank you. So Eurosif is the European Sustainable Investment Forum, and it's essentially an umbrella group for national associations that are focused on sustainable investment. So some of the members include um, associations from Sweden, from Finland, from um, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, and also includes the UK. So it's not a political European organization, it's not EU only, it's sort of geographical uh, Europe. And the UK being such a, a major financial center, um, it's very important that the UK is involved in the um, in supporting Eurosif and, and the work that it does. That work is essentially uh, been since inception of Eurosif some sort of 17, 18 years ago now has been to lobby for um, a progressive and supportive regulatory regime for sustainable investment across Europe. And today we kind of largely have that with the EU's Green Deal and the EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan. So there's been plenty of work for um, Eurosif to do on behalf of its members. And essentially its, its role is, is to act as an interlocker between um, the sustainable investment community across Europe and policymakers in Brussels and, and, and provide constructive challenge where appropriate, where the industry does not believe some of the implementation of the um, legislative tools is working as effectively as they could, um, or are creating unintended consequences that um, the Commission not being practitioners may not really be completely aware of. So that's primarily the role of the, the organization. And, um, and the last few years have been very rich in terms of the amount of work to do and the conversations with policymakers, because there are so many different streams to the policy agenda that the EU uh, has in flight right now. And I'm sure we'll talk a little more about some of them shortly. Great, fantastic. Thanks so much, Will. And uh, with regards specifically to the CSRD and the ESRS, um, what, what are you hearing? What are the investors' perspective? What expectations with regards to sustainability reporting? How, how is that going to change? Um, are there concerns or actually um, are investors excited by this? 
Well, excited is an interesting word where regulation comes to uh, <laughs> comes to the fore. But um, you, you asked about the policy priorities and certainly the um, the implementation of ESRS and other tools it, it are definitely priorities at the moment as we're beginning to see uh, the implementation from January 2024 uh, of the sort of issuer disclosure regimes. Um, one big thing for, for next year is that there are EU elections as well. Um, so there's a, an expectation from the Eurosif team in Brussels that it could be up to 40% turn over in MEP. So there's quite a lot of work to do in terms of educating and the newcomers about um, where we are with the, the sustainable finance regulation um, in, its, in its entirety and also helping influence their thinking and understanding about what the, the benefits and meeting the policy goals are for these legislative tools. And ESRS is, is one major one because there's been um, a bit of a flip-flop really in terms of the rollout and sequencing of the regulation that the EU's put into place, where investors have been required to report on information that companies have not yet been required to disclose. So there was a sort of cart before the horse kind of syndrome with um, uh, investors being subject to the SFDR, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, Taxonomy Regulation, yet awaiting those standards to be um, to be enforced through the sort of issuer um, regime, which is the ESRS. And I think that there's a generally a very supportive um, um, sentiment among investors, particularly because of um, the issues around double materiality that will come with the SRS reporting, and we can we can discuss that in a bit more detail. But really, it's because what investors will get um, is the a wider scope of information. So you know the um, the regulation will now um, inf affect 50,000 European companies were before the non-financial reporting directive was around 10. So there'll be more companies included, a lot more depth to the information that, that's required. And with the um, requirement for some form of limited assurance, then the quality should be higher. And that all of those things together um, are very welcome for investors who have the challenge of you know, looking at companies through that sustainability lens and particularly the the impact lens um, and trying to assess the, you know, the issues that um, we'll be able to compare and contrast across different different companies. And that's that's a real benefit. So I think broadly, um, welcome uh, the, uh, the the new regulation and yet and we're, but curiously to see how it will actually play out once um, once we see from January 24, the reporting cycle begins. Thanks, Will. And it's very interesting to hear how investors are looking at that impact side of the materiality. And there is a lot of debate, we know, at global level, because, of course, we know that CSRD will bring in scope organizations that are not only based in the EU, but have significant activities in the EU, and therefore may be subject to different uh, requirements and as well as different definitions and approaches to materiality. So how do you see that playing out in terms of the materiality? Well, I think from from the, the the sustainable investment community, certainly across Europe and beyond, um, they're tasked with two things. One is not only presenting and explaining the financial performance of their portfolios and their investment products. Um, certainly, certainly within the SFDR, that's a key component now. Um, but also increasingly expected to report on the impact of the companies in those portfolios beyond the financial um, risk and opportunity lens. So the double materiality approach that the EU's taken is, is welcome in that respect because it, it's helpful. It gives that dimension that um, hopefully more and more companies will understand when there's the guidance that we expect to be um, released fairly shortly before the end of 2023. Um, it could be a really important feature of understanding the the impact on um, on social and environmental issues that companies are, are generating through their business activities, because that links back to the policy goals that the EU is trying to achieve. So to meet the Paris Climate Agreement, to get that capital flowing to those um, more sustainable business activities and creating that um, low carbon economy across Europe. 
So lots of lots of kind of positives from that. I mean, it, it's become a little bit of a sort of politicized debate between the ISSB, which doesn't see the double materiality um, as that important. Um, but I think it's been welcome certainly in in the uh, in the European context, and particularly because. This, the, the investment community across Europe has got obligations to report on a range of information now from um, SFDR. So principal adverse sustainability impacts is one example of that. And embedded within the um, the ESRS is, is the requirement for companies to, to do that. So that's a, a big plus again. And back to the sort of, you know, the quality of that data, that should be really helpful for investors to meet their their legal, what are legally mandated obligations now, and it's certainly across Europe. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's a very good point. And it's, it's uh, from what we're hearing at A4S, it also helps them understanding also the macro environment and uh, that longer term horizon um, that some of them might have compared to um a single, let's say, materiality approach. Yeah. Um, so very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, so you've mentioned this debate between the ISSB and the ESRS. Of course, we have the longstanding GRI standards that many are still adopting uh, across the globe. And considering that there are so many organizations that will be brought into scope, um, what do you see as challenges uh, for issuers uh, having to disclose um, against a mix of legally mandated, actually, legally mandated and voluntary standards? Um, yeah. How do, uh, do you see this issue? Well, it, it is a mix, um, Bartini, as you quite rightly say, because you know, the, the, the grandparents of all this really is the GRI. And uh, the GRI has been heavily, uh, has heavily influenced the formation of the, uh, the ESRS um, and, and has been, been fundamental to how that's developed. ISSB has come from a slightly different background where it's, it's now modeled on the TCFD. And, and as, as we know, in some jurisdictions, the TCFD record, reporting and disclosure requirements have become mandated, they've become part of the kind of legal infrastructure of, um, of a number of countries. So there's a hybrid with ISSB in that respect. But um, in the EU, it's very much in the legislation. So the CSRD is a legislative tool and uh, the ESRS is, is the, the articulation of how that can be um, be met. So for issue is it's going to be a complicated um, future to, to navigate this. Um, but all of these things are really important and, and th there's a real intent and there's been work going on quietly in the background to, to ensure that there is a level of interoperability or fungibility between the standards and that you know doesn't become an, a really onerous and burdensome exercise for issuers particularly if they you know they they they're multinational global companies and subject to potentially reporting against all three um the GRI, do, I, I guess, in a way, acts as for those sort of orphan companies that are not subject to any of the or, or disclosing against either of ISSB or, or the ESRS. So I think there's a valid you know, role for, for all three. Um, I think it will be a bit of a, you know, be a challenge for, um, for issuers to navigate how they report against them because they're slightly different. Um, but we're still to we still need to see a bit more guidance, certainly from the um the EU on on things like about, you know, how do you assess, do that materiality assessment uh within the ESRS? And um we should see that some guidance on that before the end of 2023. Um that should be helpful, but um but for the investment community and other stakeholders, there, there should be a really rich set of information and, uh, and, and corporate disclosure um, going forward that will really help in terms of you know, moving us from that sort of investment process, which is dominated around the process to actually what are the outcomes that companies within investors' portfolios are achieving, um, not only at a political level to meet those policy goals, but also for investors looking at, you know, moving towards measuring the outcomes of their portfolios. And there's certainly a move towards that. Um, and there's a there's an increasing interest, certainly from institutional asset owners to understand that. Um, and this could be a real kind of catalytic help for everybody in moving forward. Absolutely. And um, it sounds like investors are in that situation where, you know, 
they need more information. That's for certain. It's been clear for the last few years, um, but I'm sure they will appreciate and will support the cause of harmonization as much as possible, or at least best interoperability achievable um, at absolutely. this stage. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, because the, nobody wants additional cost and complexity into uh, into the sort of ecosystem. Um, and, you know, if we end up with a situation where we've got, you know, better, deeper, high quality sustainability information available, which is comparable across jurisdictions, then um, that's a real positive step forward. And, you know, we've only really seen, even though we talked about the GRI being the grandparents of all this, it's only really this summer that we've seen the details around the um, the different uh, expectations for the ISSB and the ESRS. So we're at the, the beginning, um, but I, I'm quite cautiously optimistic this is going to be very very valuable and helpful for certainly the finance sector and um and uh, you know uh, for issuers and and the those responsible with with doing the disclosures that will be required absolutely and also uh, to the extent that it doesn't remain as a compliance exercise but then i guess the information is then used also internally to gen drive um, strategy business and, and really um, really provide that additional value on how, how to then create value um, for uh, stakeholders as well, including, of course, shareholders. Well, thanks, Will. Sorry, did you mean to add anything? No, I, I was just going to nod in a vigorous agreement with you, Martina, and that's uh, your summary. That's so I absolutely agree. Fantastic. Great. Well, thanks so much, Will, for joining um, our summit and sharing your experience. I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities going forward to engage further. Um, but best of luck with your work, uh, as, of course, the uh, activity in this space continue and actually ramp up in the coming months. Um, so thanks for sharing your experience. You're yeah, very welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Will has acknowledged the complexity of the landscape for preparers and to explore the voice of preparers, I'm delighted to be joined by Laura Palmiero, Head of Sustainable Finance at Danone, to hear a corporate perspective and discuss practical insights into how to take a strategic approach to adoption. Laura was one of the first finance professionals with a combined role of finance and sustainability, and between 2018 and 2021, she was seconded to the UN Global Compact, where she served as senior advisor on sustainability reporting, leading the creation of the SDG Action Manager tool in collaboration with BLAB and the relaunch of the Communication of Progress. Hi, everyone, and Laura, thanks so much for um, joining us today um, to discuss the implementation of ESRS. And, and it, it's wonderful to have you and hear from you some of the key insights from someone who has already started action in this area. So I'll dive straight into the question, and I'd like to ask you uh, to talk about the fact that obviously Danone has been reporting on its sustainability performance for many years. Um, and what standards have helped shape your reporting and how did their, you, their use help to address the implementation of ESRS today? Okay, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, the collaboration between uh, Danone and Accounting for Sustainability goes back a number of years. Uh, so uh, it, I'm super glad to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. So yes, as you say, we have started a while ago in Danone. Uh, we have been uh, doing sustainability reporting for many, many years, uh, starting in the early uh, 2000s. And, um, and so we have uh, very early on tried to communicate about the actions that we were doing. Uh, of course, the first sustainability reportings of the non and many companies that, that started at that time have nothing to do with uh, what we know today as, as reporting. We used to uh, communicate a lot with narratives. There were uh, little data at that time that was available, but very soon we uh, realized that what was important was for um, the users of the information to uh, uh, to be uh, to uh, to be very confident that what they were reading was uh, actually representing the truth of what the non was doing. So we very early as well we started collaborating with uh, uh, external audit firms to have our data audited and uh, and certified and verified. So um, 
first of all, I would say that we uh, the first uh, the first set set of uh, standards that we used, as many others, I imagine in the market, was the GRI, of course, that helped so many of us uh, to uh, uh, to have kind of a checklist of what we should be reporting when talking about sustainability. Uh, then uh, being in France, something that uh, that appeared uh, very early as well was the uh, Loi Grenelle, the Grenelle II law that started giving guidance to uh, to uh, French companies on what we should be reporting. And unlike the GRI, it was not a voluntary reporting; it was uh, mandatory because of the law. Then this was followed by the DPBF, uh, which is uh, well known in France among practitioners, which is Déclaration de Performance Extra Financière. It is uh, simply the non-financial reporting directive and the transposition of that directive into the French law. And uh, now we see arriving the CSRD and the ESRS that result from that. So, um, so yes, it is a it is a long journey that uh, that uh, as you see we uh, we have taken very seriously and uh, as I always say something that is important is the collaboration the external collaboration of of third parties uh, to verify this information so that we can create uh, trust with the people using the information. And that's very helpful. Thanks, and and clearly uh, shows how how it's been a long journey. And you've mentioned the uh, use of GRI to start with. Um, what are the key differences or new areas that you need a plan for with regards to implementing now the ESRS, which we know are to an extent built on the GRI standards? Yes, of course. So, uh, well, the the I would say there are a few main differences. Um, uh, I think that the preciseness of uh, what is demanded by the uh, ESRS is much bigger than anything that uh, we had seen before. That is one uh, big, uh, big thing. But I would say that um, the main feature of what we are seeing today in terms of sustainability reporting in, in Europe is um, the level to which the um, sustainable finance term uh, takes real place in our reporting. What I'm trying to say is that now uh, the extra financial reporting is very connected and I would say practically embedded in financial reporting. And the reason for this is that there are a lot, there are a lot of requirements in the new laws in order to make the connection between what is happening and what we are reporting uh, and our plans, what we're planning to do in the future regarding extra financials and the impact of those in our accounts. Not only our plans, but also as, as you might be aware of, uh, the analysis of risks and opportunities, they have to be very well linked uh, in terms of what is the potential impact, be it positive or negative, in our accounts. And uh, and this is super interesting because it is, as I said before, it is kind of forcing or enabling in a certain way the connection between uh, extra financial and financial. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Laura. And I guess what, what we are hearing is really that provision of a very integrated view is absolutely key, both for external stakeholders, but also internally really to try and think in a very integrated way. So thanks mm -hmm. for sharing sharing that. Um, in terms of um, the steps that you've been taking in terms of implementing the ESRS, we know that you, next year will be your first year uh, of reporting under the ESRS. So, so what are the first steps you've been taking so far? And can you share any lessons learned with, with our audience? Yes, of course. So as um, it is not a surprise in these kind of exercises, you always start with defining what is material and non-material. And because there has been a very, um, I would say, a change in the materiality definition in the sense that now it is defined in a much more precise way and with a very specific, uh, I would say, steps that need to be followed, then obviously, uh, even if we already had an analysis, a materiality analysis, we needed to start uh, preparing one. So even if we, <clears throat> sorry, even if we are, um, uh, only obliged to report on that by the end of next year, it is important for us because this is the framework uh, 
uh, to begin with uh, about what are the topics that we're going to be reporting on. So if we want to start working on, on that reporting, we need to, uh, to, to define materiality very, very early on. So we started working at the beginning of this year and we are right now uh, around this month to finish our first exercise of double materiality always starting first with uh, the impact materiality, which then informs uh, those topics that uh, are going to also be having some kind of impact in our accounts. Um, what's, what is a lesson learned that, of course, it is a lot of work for everybody. And uh, at the beginning, I would say that myself and my team, we were not the best friends of every person in the company because we were asking a lot of questions and making people uh, uh, spend a lot of time in meeting rooms and having lots of discussions. But I would say that even if it, it might look as a painful process, um, it gives a lot of insight about our business, about what are the real uh, uh, risks and opportunities. And there is a beauty behind, which is involving everybody in the company. We uh, have around the table, well, in a succession of meetings, obviously, uh, we have consulted between, I would say, around 40 to 50 people. And that is a lot and very senior people. So uh, what means is that, what it means is that this topic that we were doing by ourselves, usually uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our company and in our offices, uh, now it started to be uh, a topic of everybody inside of the company and every function is doing their kind of their little, um, uh, uh, I would say, assessment of their own risk and opportunities on sustainability issues. It is, it is really uh, super interesting to, to witness that. Fantastic, Laura. And I guess it's, it's very interesting to see how um, really implementing a requirement, a reporting requirement is, is really driving the thinking and the decision making potentially then within the organization by doing that. Um, did you find that uh, the scope of your reporting changed at the back of that exercise? Well, yes, uh, it will change. I would say not that much the scope in terms of the topics that we discovered uh, because I don't think that there were uh, material topics that we were not reporting on. Mm -hmm. on it. But the way on which we are going to report on them uh, has changed because it is really embedded in our business. Uh, because we will have, as I mentioned before, we will have to report on how this has an impact in our business and how this impacts society and the planet in a very... Um, I would say in a much more deep uh, understanding and and uh, and the manifestation of that impact. We need to measure it, and uh, at the least, we need to be able to give uh, uh, to give uh, good measurements, even if it is not um, uh, financially speaking at the beginning, but a good measurement about those impacts. So that the depth of the analysis. I think that changes everything in the exercise and the, and the implication of all the different functions of the company. Thank you. Um, in terms of this exercise, Laura, I, I, I believe you directly report to the CFO, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, can you explain a bit the, the central role that your team has played sitting within finance and how has that helped? Yes. Well, this is uh, quite new. It started uh, in April last year. I have been uh, doing this for a number of years now. Uh, the first time that I, I I left finance, pure finance, and I joined uh, sustainability metrics, let's say, to create that department in a certain way that started in environment. That was in 2009. And uh, I started with a measurement of CO2. And... Uh, very intuitively, the people working on CO2, they realized that if they wanted to get serious about analyzing that, they needed someone that um, 
knows how to account, how to consolidate, how to uh, run processes to organize a reporting for the whole company and how to communicate about externally. So um, so that is that is uh, why you mentioned that I, I, I started quite early. And uh, but I have seen the whole journey of Danone in this and of other companies. And uh, we, um, it has been a long journey. And what has started first as uh, the people that had a responsibility on the different topics, social, environmental, and health, in the case of, of Danone, uh, on the nutrition profile of our products, the same people having the responsibility for, for the topic itself, for the substance of the topic, they were the ones measuring. What has happened last year, and it has been, uh, I would say, a major change, a major structural change, is that we took all the teams that were doing this measurement in the different, uh, within the different teams in sustainability in the company, and we put these expert measurement teams all together with the people doing the actual reporting. And we formed this sustainable uh, finance team, which I am uh, the head of, uh, reporting directly to Jürgen Esser, to our CFO. And uh, we did this because we realized that the, the measurement side of the extra financial performance uh, has grown both internally and externally through these new regulations, has grown very, uh, it has been professionalized. And we needed to have a team that was all together doing specifically reporting. And uh, and this is why we decided to create this. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, there is now a better link to the impacts uh, that uh, this, uh, these extra financial performances have on finance. So it makes more, even more sense. Also, we have a lot of uh, synergies uh, with other teams where we need to ask for collaboration, like for instance, uh, internal control, internal audit, talking with m a to fix uh, some uh, you know targets and parameters that need to be re uh, respected when we do m a uh, taxes, a lot of taxes that are being created everywhere uh, based on extra financial performance, and very importantly, investor relations. We are very much in contact with the team of investor relations because they are receiving every year in just in 2003, as compared to last year, we have doubled the number of questions received uh, from investors on extra financials. So for all these reasons, it made total sense to, to nest this expertise team uh, within the, the, finance, uh, the finance sector in them. Makes a lot of sense, Laura, and it's very interesting to see how really you clearly say how responsibility is starting to be embedded within the finance team on the their day to day operations, and it must be quite um, an achievement for you having been one of the first people globally, really, to have such a role combined with combining sustainability and finance um to see this happening um uh, before, in front of your eyes so um so well done um in terms of the implementation of esrs one last question from me um is there anything that excites you um some, something that you are thinking of approaching or planning to to approach things in a different way um anything new that really makes you feel okay this is a worthwhile change despite the challenges well, uh, as I said before, I think it um, there are two main things. The, the, the best thing is that sustainability so far, sustainability metrics has been a question of experts. <clears throat> and uh, we have been a little bit on our side doing this measurement and dealing with uh, kind of uh, esoteric stuff for other, <laughs> other parts of the company. Now, we are kind of uh, little by little invading all the all the different functions, and uh, we are doing a lot of connections. It is super interesting to to see how a regulation can have the impact of actually making a change within a company, even if we had been, as you know, we have been uh, leaders in in sustainability for for many many years. 
but even so the way of of, of uh, i would say the people the, all the rest of the people seeing that they need to get involved because their job has a, a very quantifiable impact in what is happening in in our extra financial performance and um one thing that i would like to mention that that i think is key is uh and i and i uh, don't think that is uh, we are talking a lot about this but it will come very soon this is kind of a prediction is uh is the role of uh technology mm -hmm. uh the amount of data that needs to be uh treated the amount of uh changes in our processes in order to gather this data is becoming a little bit like a parallel uh financial system running totally in parallel and asking data that has never been asked before and asking to comply to certain things that have never been asked to be complied before uh both small businesses and big businesses like the one of the norm uh we can only do this with uh, big data and uh, with companies developing tools to help us because it will happen in that way or it will not happen. This is not something that, uh, this is a big revolution that is coming and it will not happen on an Excel file. It's impossible to do that. So uh, so I think that there is, um, there, is, there is a topic that really needs to be, uh, to be tackled with, uh, with the big tech companies that can help us on, on, this, on this journey. Well, fantastic, Laura. I think you've touched on all the key key points we we wanted to hear from you, and 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 really um, highlighting um, the difficulty of this, but at the same time, uh, really making very motivating points. I would say uh, for people who are who are to approach this, and and really bringing the relevance um, to to people's roles uh, in terms of that and and the ability to make their impact. So, thanks so much for sharing your insights, your experience. We're extremely grateful to have you and uh, we hope to have you back soon in one of the other sections. Why not? Maybe on technology. <laughs> okay, great. I would love that. <laughs> thank okay, you, Lara. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to Laura, we will now be hearing from Melanie Kreis, CFO of DHL Group, the world's largest logistic company. DHL Group has been reporting on sustainability-related information for over a decade, and she will share her insights on how DHL is in the process of implementing the standards, what role the organization has played in shaping them, and very importantly, her tips for getting started. So DHL Group has been engaged in ESG reporting for quite a while for internal transparency reasons, but also because as a very large organization, more than 500,000 employees, 50 billion in market cap and so on, we are normally subject to whatever mandatory reporting requirement is out there. And so of course also the European reporting requirements have applied to us. What was important for us now also over the last um, uh, months and quarters in uh, the preparation for CSRD and uh, the new European sustainability reporting standards was to work in close collaboration with other stakeholders. And here the A4S network was very helpful, but we were also directly engaged in the um, uh, EFRAC technical expert group. Our head of sustainability accounting and reporting was a member of the EFRAC technical group. So we were able to also provide our practical experience uh, with reporting requirements uh, to that group. I think it's very important because as you probably all know, uh, it's a very complex stakeholder process uh, where you have very different stakeholders at the table. And for us as a big uh, corporate, it was important that also the practical realities of what does it actually mean to apply the new ESRS were considered in the standard setting discussions. Once again, thank you to Will, Laura and Melanie for sharing your thoughts with us today. We heard very interesting perspectives and practical takeaways on how organizations can get started on this journey. And I would like to take this time to thank all of our speakers and audience here today for joining us at the A4S Summit 2023. 
We've heard some great insights in relation to the trends shaping our world and the practical actions that can be taken to build a resilient, sustainable economy. All sessions will be now available on demand for all registered participants, and we do hope to see you again next year at the A4S Summit. Thank you.